I get to stand up there next week and look at people. And I love you guys that are here, but, you know, different faces, you know. <laughs> uh, if you have been keeping up with our class on Thursday afternoon at 3 o'clock, which is going to be shifting to Wednesday next week, by the way, get things more in line with our usual schedule. Uh, we've been talking about the book of Ezra. We've been moving on to Nehemiah sometime in the future. Uh, Ezra is a book about the captives that were taken away from Jerusalem, from Judah, and from the north a uh, couple years before, if you will, uh, taken away to captivity. Now they're allowed to come back and rebuild the Lord's house, is how it's often called in the book of Ezra. It's interesting that we don't see the word temple used at all in the book of Ezra. We see the Lord's house. And what we mean by the Lord's house is, of course, the temple of God in Jerusalem, uh, which was destroyed eventually in AD 70 after Herod did some, uh, some touch-up work uh, before Christ was born. And so if you look at the actual language of talking about temple as being the Lord's house, it's an interesting idea. We know that in Acts chapter 17, Paul, when talking about the idea of God to people that didn't understand that there was just one creator, he talked about that he's not someone that lives within the confines of walls and you know, receives the offerings from us as if he needed anything. And so the idea of the temple being called the Lord's house is an interesting kind of way to think about the temple in the Old Testament and how it's also used in a spiritual sense of the church in the New Testament. And so today what I want to do is look at a couple of passages, uh, mostly from the Old Testament, about the idea of the Lord's house, and specifically the phraseology of the mountain of the Lord's house. Now just kind of interestingly, we look at Jerusalem, and there is Mount Zion in Jerusalem itself, which is not really a large mountain, but it's kind of a... Um, you know, an enfilade in which you kind of go up a little bit, and that's where the temple was built. And if you look at that kind of concept, we're looking at the temple of God being built basically on top of a mountain. So it kind of everything flows up into it. And that imagery of the mountain of the Lord's house or temple is used kind of literally, is also used figuratively a couple of times in the Bible as well. So let's begin our conversation in the book of Psalms. Uh, we have four points this morning in case you're keeping track and you kind of want a, a timeline for us. It should not be an hour long sermon. The days of that is, is over. Hanging up my cap of long sermons and getting back to a regular schedule. So the book of Psalms is going to be for our first point. And we're looking at, in the book of Psalms, Psalm 74 specifically. 74. This is from Asaph, we think. Let's talk about the place of dwelling. Psalm 74, let's begin in verse 1. O oh God, why do you cast us off forever? Why does your anger smoke against the sheep of your pasture? So we have, of course, the psalm immediately, something bad has happened. And the author here of this psalm knows that God is in control and he is punishing his people for some reason. And then verse 2, remember your congregation. He's saying, remember us, remember who we are and what we're all about, which you have purchased of old. So the idea of the redemption from Egypt is brought into play here. Which you have redeemed to be the tribe of your heritage. So you chose us to represent you throughout the world. And then finally here in verse 2, remember Mount Zion where you have dwelt. And so something bad's going on, and the song is basically trying to talk about God as allowing bad things to happen to his people, and then to describe to God where they are and what they are. He says, remember that you bought us, and you led us here. Remember that you live among us within Mount Zion, the mountain of the Lord's house. That's where you live among us. So let's move forward here, or kind of back, I suppose, to Psalm 68. Psalm 68. Let's begin reading 
verse 14. So Psalm 68, 14. When the Almighty scatters kings there, let snow fall on Zalman, which is a mountain. O mountain of God, mountain of Bashan, O many peaked mountain, mountain of Bashan, why do you look with hatred, verse 16, O many, uh, many peaked mountain, at the mount that God desired for his abode, yes, where the Lord will dwell forever. The chariots of God are twice ten thousand, thousands upon thousands. The Lord is among them. Sinai is now in the sanctuary. So this is all kind of descriptive poetic language talking about the enemies of God. They have their mountains, but they pale in comparison to the idea of the mountain of God where he lives, which is Mount Zion. He's going to live there forever, it says here in this text in verse 16. So let's jump forward once again. Psalm 78. Psalm 78. This is a long psalm, if you didn't know. Let's drop down to verse 68. But he chose the tribe of Judah, Mount Zion, which he loves. He built his sanctuary like the high heavens, like the earth, which he has founded forever. He chose David his servant and took him from the sheepfolds. From following the nursing ewes, he brought him to shepherd Jacob, his people, Israel, his inheritance. So we have here again the idea of Israel being talked about and specifically where God dwells, which is Mount Zion, which he loves. Verse 68. And then finally, let's go to Psalm 87. Psalm 87. Beginning in verse 1. On the holy mount stands the city he founded. So talking about Jerusalem. The Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all, in, all the dwelling places of Jacob. Glorious things of you are spoken, O city of God. All right. So in these Psalms, we've read four of them now. And just kind of randomly, we see that throughout all of these the psalmist, through inspiration, is remarking about Mount Zion, or Jerusalem, as the mountain of the Lord's house, in kind of a symbolic way. That's where God is among his people, the mountain of the Lord's house. So we see that, and that's more literal, right? We are looking at a poetic book here, book of Psalms, but it's talking about literally Mount Zion in Jerusalem, upon which the the temple or this, the house of God is built. And so all of these things kind of invoke a sense of imagery of a physical location, a physical hill, a physical house, and God dwells there among his people. And that's kind of the, the foundation we're laying here is to see how this imagery of the mountain of the Lord's house, if you will, is rooted in that foundation of a literal dwelling place of God. Now, we keep that in mind, and we move forward to the book of Isaiah. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 2. Let's begin in verse 1. Now, in case you don't know, Isaiah is a prophet book, right? He's a major prophet because it's a very long book. And Isaiah is probably the most well-known major prophet among those that are in our canon. And Isaiah was writing at a time when Israel was prosperous. There was relative peace when it comes to its national security. Uh, everything was going well. There was a high level of immorality, though, among the people because they were worshiping God, but they are also worshiping other gods. And so basically Israel's trying to bring about repentance. But scattered throughout his book, is not only the idea you need to repent or you'll go to captivity, which comes to pass hundreds of years later, and then it, he gives little sprinklings of prophecy. We think about a prophet as someone usually who is like looking into the future and sees some things that are kind of dark and he gives you a riddle and you've got to figure it out later, but uh, really prophets were just preachers or spokesmen or heralds is what the, the title really means. Uh, the ones that were literally bubbling up is the Hebrew imagery there. But if you look at Isaiah, he's giving you little glimpses of what he's seeing to be a reality in the future. And that's what happens here in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 1. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. So let's kind of 
focus in on our, our recipient here. This is a message given to him, Isaiah, from God about Judah, so the southern tribes, and specifically Jerusalem. So that's our location in question, right? It shall come to pass in the latter days. And if you think about that phrase, latter days, you've got a lot of folks that kind of go insane whenever they hear that phrase because they think about, oh, the last days of the book of Revelation. No, this literally means in the next time frame, the next time period is what that literally means. That the mountain of the Lord's house, or the house, or the mountain of the house of the Lord in this ESV says, shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hill. So we're looking at the idea of the temple, right? The imagery there brought to us from Jerusalem, from Mount Zion, the mountain of the Lord's house, that's talking about the temple of God. And it's saying that later, in the next time period, it's going to be lifted up. It's going to be the highest peak of all the land. Now, is that literal? It's kind of difficult to be literal because you still got Everest around, right? And so we're talking about Jerusalem versus Everest, which is higher nowadays. Everest is still higher, right? Last time I checked anyway. And so you don't have this being a literal exaltation of a literal physical rock mound upon which the temple is built. It's not even around anymore. It's being lifted up above there. So through Isaiah's message here, we see it being not really symbolic, but more spiritual or metaphorical, right? And all the nations shall flow into it. Now, I love the way he says that because it's just the opposite of what you would expect. It's almost like a paradox. If there's one thing I know about the New Testament, there are a bunch of things that are a paradox within there. If you want to be the greatest Christian in the world, what did Jesus say you have to be? Servant of all. So you want to be lifted up. You want to be exalted. What do you have to do? Abase yourself. You lower yourself to a servant like our Lord was. If you want to save your own life, what will you do? You're going to lose it. But if you're willing to give up your life, then you'll find it. So there's a, the paradox of Christianity. The same thing is kind of true here. Things don't usually flow uphill, right? Now, I'm no plumber, but I know if I want to get some water from a lower position to a higher position through a pipe, it's not going to flow because gravity is kind of still around, right? You have to force it to go up there. And so here the paradox is you've got the temple of God, the mountain of the Lord's house, being lifted up and people flowing into it. So just the imagery there is definitely specific. Uh, verse 3, and here's how they flow up to it, by the way. And many people, people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. So here we have the connection of the mountain and the house being parallel in structure in this statement. That he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his path. So how do, does all nations flow into the house of the Lord? Because they choose to go up to the mountain to learn from God, which is a, a highly talked about theme in Scripture as well, going to the mountain to get closer to God is the idea. For or because, this is um, 3 part B, out of Zion, so from Jerusalem, shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So here we have in Isaiah's message a prophecy that the mountain of the house of the Lord is not going to be really in Jerusalem anymore. It's going to be higher than that. And you have a group of people that want to go learn from God, so they choose to ascend the mountain and learn from God there to walk in His ways because that's where the law of God starts. Now, we look at this and we have the benefit of knowing what in the world He's talking about. For hundreds of years, folks had no idea what He's talking about here. Uh, but we know because we look into the book of Luke and the book of Acts and you see Jesus saying, you guys, my disciples, I'm going to leave soon, but you stay in Jerusalem until you get the Holy Spirit because you're going to speak the gospel, essentially, to paraphrase what the Lord said. 
And so you have literally the law of God, the gospel of Christ, being started in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, and from that the gospel spread throughout the entirety of the world. And if you want to ascend the mountain of the house of the Lord today, you don't have to go back to Jerusalem. You just have to go to the word of God. And you ascend the mountain by learning from him and then obeying his commandments. So that's what Isaiah is talking about. And we have the benefit of knowing exactly what he's referring to here through this prophet, uh, prophetic utterance. Now, let's jump forward here in the book of Isaiah to chapter 8. Isaiah 8. Let's see, let's drop back into 11 for context. So again, Isaiah chapter 8, verse 11. For the Lord spoke thus to me with his strong hand upon me, and warned me not to walk in the way of this people, saying, Do not call conspiracy, uh, all this people calls conspiracy, and do not fear what they fear, nor be in dread, because the Lord of hosts, him you shall honor as holy, let him be your fear, let him be your dread. So you have kind of a, a, a mind check for Isaiah. He's saying, listen, don't be afraid of what the people are afraid of. They should be afraid of me. So Isaiah is kind of getting the, the message clear from the Lord. He will become a sanctuary and a stone of offense and a rock of stumbling to both houses of Israel, a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So in one side of the coin, you have him being a sanctuary, so a place to rest and to feel secure and to feel safe if you are obeying his commandments and his will. On the other side of the coin, you have him being a stone of offense or a rock of stumbling. So instead of being a place where you go uh, to feel safe and secure, you're stumbling over this place of safety and you're tripping and falling into uh, despair is the idea. Verse 15, and many shall stumble on it. They shall fall and be broken. They shall be snared and taken. Bind up the testimony. Seal the teaching among my disciples. I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob, and I will hope in him. So Isaiah is kind of speaking for himself here. Like, I am going to trust in God because the Lord's not shining well upon Israel right now. Verse 18. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord have given me are signs and portents in Israel for the Lord of hosts, and then he throws this in there for good measure, who dwells on Mount Zion. All right, so you have Isaiah talking about the mountain of the Lord's house in a spiritual, maybe even metaphorical way in chapter 2, a prophetic way, talking about the church. But here you have him dropping back into the language of the book of Psalms, talking about the Lord as dwelling within the temple in Jerusalem. So if, if you have a city who has God living among them, you think they would be doing what is right. But here he's saying, no, it's not going to be a place of sanctuary, but a stone of offense or a stone of stumbling. Well, let's jump forward to chapter 18. Isaiah 18. Let's see. We'll begin in verse 4. For thus says the Lord to uh, for thus the Lord said to me, I will quietly look from my dwelling. By the way, how do you not quietly look? I don't know. Like clear heat and sunshine, like a cloud of dew in the heat of harvest. For before the harvest, when the blossom is over and the flower becomes a ripening grape, grape, he cuts off the shoots with pruning hooks and the spreading branches he lops off and clears away. So you have basically a time of harvest when you're about to go out and get the produce that you've been working and waiting for all this time. The Lord's just going to remove it from you. You're not going to have it anymore. Um, Isaiah specifically is probably thinking about Assyria here, and he throws out the idea of pruning hooks uh, that has connotations for the Assyrians. Verse 6, they all... That they shall all of them be left to the birds of prey on the mountains and to the beasts of the earth. 
and the birds of prey will summer on them, and all the beasts of the earth will winter on them. So they're all going to die, and the animals are going to eat them. Verse 7, at, the same, at that time, tribute will be brought to the Lord of hosts from a people tall and smooth, from a people feared near and far, a nation mighty and conquering, whose land the rivers divide. So the, the old rivers from the Garden of Eden have, have now been discussed here, Tigris and Euphrates, right? So you have the Assyrians being talked about. To Mount Zion. So you have these people from far away. They're going to come and they're going to kill all the Israelites in Jerusalem where the Lord dwells, and he's allowing it to happen. That's the prophecy of captivity. To the place of the name of the Lord of hosts. So the place where the Lord's name is known, Jerusalem. And then you have there to Mount Zion talked about here specifically. So you have the place of dwelling talked about in the book of Psalms. The Lord dwells there in the temple on the mountain with his people. That's where the Lord is. And then we have further descriptions given by Isaiah. It's not only just this physical location of Jerusalem, but it's also talking about in the future being a spiritual kind of metaphorical place, not in Jerusalem, but the law shall go forth from there, which we know is the gospel of the Lord. Now, let's jump forward to the book of Micah. Micah. I'll give you a moment to find it, because it's hard to find Micah. We don't know where it is. One of those minor prophets, right? I'm told there's some kind of song that we teach our kids about how to memorize the book, books of the Bible. Is that true? Melissa knows it, so I guess so. I don't know it. I didn't grow up in the church, and so I had to learn the hard way. You know. <laughs> it's kind of a joke. Okay, chapter 4, verse 1. It shall come to pass in the latter days. Well, there's our phrase from Isaiah, right? So he's writing like a prophet writes, talking about the next time period uh, from where they were writing from. We're looking at Christianity here. That the mountain of the house of the Lord. So the exact same phraseology that Isaiah used talking about Jerusalem shall be established as the highest of the mountains. I wonder where he got that message from. Well, obviously, Micah just had a copy of Isaiah lying around and just copied him, right? It couldn't be the same author. That's all tongue-in-cheek talk for the idea of inspiration. If you have two people that have the same Holy Spirit guiding them or carrying or, or bearing them along as they write, it's going to sound somewhat similar. And it shall be lifted up above the hills, and people shall flow to it. And many people shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, that we may walk in his path. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So the exact same prophecy from Isaiah, re re-recorded, I suppose, in the book of Micah as well. Micah um, is past the time of Isaiah just by a little bit. Let's drop down here to verse 6. In that day, declares the Lord, I will assemble the lame. So the lame here are folks that can't walk, right? Well, <laughs> it's funny that I think about the things I used to not understand, because I, I say it like, obviously we all know what the word lame means. When I first read it, as a 15-year-old kid, I did not know lame meant you couldn't walk. I thought it meant that you were lame. So I was like, all right, so I'm lame. So the Lord's calling me, that's, that's how I read it. I was like, okay, so I'm not liked by people. I'm lame, so people are like me are called to the gospel. That's not what it means. Uh, not in this passage anyway. And gather those who have been driven away and those whom I have afflicted. And, I, and the lame, I will make the remnant. And those who were cast off, a strong nation, and the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from this time forth and forevermore. Don't miss that. So we see here not only the spiritual exaltation of the mountain of the Lord's house in a spiritual sense, just like Isaiah meant, but you also have this extra little thing here from Micah that, yeah, but we're going to restore Jerusalem too, which is exactly what we're reading about in the book of Ezra. Uh, Micah's prophecy came true because they came back from captivity when they were cast off, and they rebuild the idea of the temple, 
but more significantly was the previous prophecy of Jerusalem not just being a place where God dwelt in his temple, but now we are the temple of God, which is much more significant for us. Now let's jump forward all the way, for sake of brevity, to the book of Revelation. Why not? Now, Revelation, in case you're unaware, is in the New Testament. Seems pretty obvious. It's the very last book written in the canon of the New Testament, likely written in AD 100 or something, around there, uh, 94, 96, something around there, written by John the Apostle, who also wrote the Gospel account of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and then Revelation, right? He was an old man when he wrote this, and it was specifically written in apocalyptic language, which is a very scary word, but all it means is it's veiled. That word apocalypse just means it's veiled or covered. And so he's not going to say, hey, by the way, we're talking about the Romans here. He's going to say, no, we're talking about Babylon, right? So you have this coded language in which you talk about something pretty obvious, and if you know what he's talking about, you see the signs, and if you don't know, if you're a Roman, for example, and you're only reading Latin, this is not going to make a whole lot of sense to you. It's just some kind of strange book. And so this is not talking about things that are happening in our day and age anymore. We're not looking forward to any of these signs or prophecies to take place. Uh, I think I've heard every single president since I've been alive called the Antichrist from the book of Revelation, right? So there's all this kind of conspiracy nonsense stuff's out there, but specifically for us, looking at the mountain of the Lord's house. Chapter 14, if you have a Bible that has little section headings, it talks about the Lamb, which is the only description of Jesus in the book of Revelation when it comes to him being a figure, by the way, the Lamb, and the 144,000. Now, the 144,000 are not the only people that are saved. Um, by the way. So let's just begin reading in verse 1. And then I looked, he's in a spiritual vision setting here, and behold, on Mount Zion, so in Jerusalem, on top of the temple, you might imagine, stood the Lamb, talking about Jesus, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. Now we look at that and we say, that's strange. Uh, but the, the real meaning behind this from the book of Exodus all the way back in the day was his name shall be on your foreheads and on your hands was one meaning. It means that whatever you think and whatever you do, think about the Lord first. And so you've got this description here of 144,000 who we can just supply who are Christians following Jesus, who's the Lamb, on Mount Zion, talked about here in verse 2. And I heard a voice from heaven like the roar of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. The voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps, and they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. So we pause right there. This is a throwback image from John to the book of Isaiah. Because in Isaiah, Isaiah was brought before the throne room of God himself. And there are these four creatures that were singing his praises all day long. And so what we get here from John is he's saying, I'm looking at the new Mount Zion, where the Lord Jesus allowed us to get. And it's right there with those people who are Christians. And it's right there in the throne room of God. And they get to sing his praise. So the whole point of all of this from John's perspective, I assume, is to say Christians are victorious. If you want to make it to the throne room of God, you have to get there through Mount Zion, through the Lord, through Christ. And then you get to be with God forever. So he's saying don't give up is the real message there. But the imagery of bringing Mount Zion into this where the law came forth kind of gives it that extra punch to describe the deliverance that they received through the law of God that came forth from the, the mountain of the Lord's house. Now let's jump forward here to chapter 20. 
This is the real impact text, right? Verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. I know John is doing his best here, but that's a huge statement, right? Can you imagine being John? And you know Jesus, you know the Lord, you've served him your entire life, you're an old man now, you're on the cusp of going to him forever, and you get one last little vision, and you see the throne and God on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. This is unlike anything this world has ever seen. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. The sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. So verse 15, if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. And so all of this is talking about the idea of going to the Lord for judgment, judgment day, kind of famously called this. And then chapter 21, verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, because the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw, guess what? The holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. A new creation, you might say, a new place to live, a new Eden, but all the earth is Eden. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, and here is the point. The dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be them uh, as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more. uh, Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, because all the former things have passed away. Verse 5, And he who is seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And then to John aside, he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, It is done. You might say it is finished, right? Echoing the words of Christ on the cross. I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage. I will be his God. He shall be my son. So you have this remarkable message of what the future holds, again in a veiled language here, to encourage the people that in the first century were going through brutality when it comes to suffering for the sake of Christianity, John's message is, remember the mountain of the Lord's house? Remember Jerusalem? Remember Zion, the place where God was? It's not in Jerusalem anymore, but it's waiting for you on the other side. And the Lord wants you to live there among his presence with him forever. So you look at the book of Psalms and you see that the foundation we laid was the Lord lives in Zion. That's where the Lord is. If you want to be with the Lord, you have to be in Zion. We see a description of this future Zion talked about in Acts chapter 2, also Isaiah chapter 2. We have the declaration of what that is going to be like post-reconstruction of the physical temple from Micah chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. And then finally, the deliverance that we receive when we're delivered from this physical world, the spiritual world with God forever, The mountain of the Lord's house is going to be there. That's where we want to be. That's the message. It's just encouragement, a reminder of what our goal is. And now that we know what our goal is and how that phrase is used more specifically in Scripture, whenever you see it, hopefully that will remind you of what we're talking about.
is the goal to get to the mountain of the Lord's house to be with him forever. Let's pray. Our Father, we come to you now in prayer. We're so very thankful for the message that you've given to us in your word, that we can extract and pull out these concepts and these phrases and these ideas and to understand them, to think about them, and to focus on what our goals in life should be. Father, we know that you are great beyond all description, Lord. We have this image from John of who you are and what you're all about and, and what the future holds for all of us when it comes to our eternal security, and we're just so thankful that you've revealed this to him and to all of us through his word. We thank you for your patience, for your long-suffering, for your kindness and your grace towards us as we often fail you. We fall short, Father, and we know that you know that, and that you love us anyway. Thank you for all you've done for us in the recent months and weeks that we've had to endure not being together physically. We are so very thankful that we have the hope of being together again next week, and we look forward to praising you all together with one voice next week, Lord, if it be your will. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen.